Why, hello there, kobolds and goblins alike. Shams Nelson here from Pen and Blade. And in this episode, we're starting off a new series of world building videos based upon this The Kobold's Guide to World Building. Oh, yeah. So, this is an interesting book uh, published by Kobold Press, and it has a bunch of essays, short, a uh, few, several pages, like three or four pages, usually on average, each essays about world building specifically for uh, tabletop role-playing games. So, since I am developing my own tabletop role-playing game called World of Chibu, I thought it might help to be informed and to do the best job I can. And I want to take you guys along on this journey because it's pretty interesting stuff, whether you're a DM or whether you're trying to develop your own tabletop role-playing game system, or if you're writing a novel or doing something else that requires some kind of world-building. Uh, I think there are a lot of great tips in this book in these different chapters so we're gonna go chapter by chapter and in today's video we're gonna be talking about the chapter called what is setting design by Wolfgang Bauer all right and this is a pretty good introductory chapter kind of giving you the feel for what it is you're doing when you're world building and he calls it setting design and let me read to you what he says about setting design if you ask me today I'd say the goal of setting design is to create a background or setting for fantasy gaming, one that provides a rich but not unlimited range of choices to both players and game masters. In addition, the successful design must establish sources of conflict and motivation for heroes and villains who act to in an, in who act in the setting to entertain the players. So there are two things I'm taking away from this. Two <laughs> things I'm taking away from this uh, initially is that there is a rich but not unlimited range of choices for the players. Now, usually people think about like sand uh, dungeons and dragons and other tabletop role-playing games often are one of two things either the sandbox environment where the characters can do whatever they want they could literally say I'm gonna go walk in that direction but there's nothing in that direction that's what I do and then like the DMs just like all right let me come up with some stuff that's in that direction then there's the linear and some I've heard it called railroading um, adventures or um, where they basically like you're gonna follow this one path like you're gonna see this guy first then you're gonna fight this dude then you're gonna go here then you're gonna go there you can't go left or right dungeons are pretty much like a physical manifestation of this design quality because the dungeons literally have walls that you cannot go out of and if you wanted to make it linear like one room after the other you could do that and it would literally they just have to do one room Go to the next room maybe at one point you could split them off have two different choices but they come back again to the same final boss or whatever so it's still pretty linear with a couple extra choices here it's almost like he's saying something in the middle we want to have the sandbox quality giving the characters a rich i think rich was the word he used rich but not unlimited all right so you want to have like a lot of good choices but not like, I mean, I guess there technically could be unlimited choices, but give, them one, give the players enough good choices that they're going to want to choose one of those. Um, and I think a w the, the way to do this is to, or the way I like to do it, is to have kind of like a, um, like not a right or wrong answer, but different ways of approaching the same situation. So maybe like, let's say a dragon is attacking the city, okay? A uh, pretty, pretty basic uh, fantasy plot or whatever. Something's... The dragon's going to attack, so something's going to happen, even if the players do nothing. So that's a nice thing about, about those kind of things. But also, the players might choose, like, you could set it up so that the players could say, okay, there's one solution, the mayor has uh, suggested that we take this solution. But then the royal guard wants to go to the dragon's lair and slay him there before he comes. Or maybe you want to join the dragon and take over the city with the dragon, betraying your own people. There are three choices right there. Um, and I think you could add maybe one or two more if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, so basically that's going to give the players like a good amount of things they can do. Or they could even make up their own option based upon the other options they're seeing. They're like, well, maybe I'll go and I'll pretend to uh, be taking the dragon's side. But then I'll betray him at the very end to help the uh, royal guards plan. It'll make it more likely to succeed. Something like that. All right. So that was uh, uh, that alone. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty. That's pretty uh, opening my mind up a little bit about this. And then the other part is, in addition, the hero, the successful design must establish sources of conflict and motivation for heroes and villains who act in the setting to entertain the players. So entertain the players. You want to keep things entertaining. And also the you. So you're going to create an environment in which both the heroes, the players, and the villains, the NPCs, enemies 
have realistic and believable motivations for what they're doing. All right, so he goes on to say that there's an issue with a lot of people who design, who do world designs, and I've seen, I've done it. I've seen people who've do, done it. If you guys join me on our Discord, um, we love to do some world building there, and we like to get in depth. But he's saying like, uh, we, you might want to avoid the clomping foot of nerdism. Is <laughs> literally, <laughs> I got it underlined right there. Apparently, that's something someone said. Someone named uh, M. John Harrison. So the clomping foot of nerdism is when you want to create a world that's just, you got to create every detail of your world. You're drawing every detail of the map. You're figuring out every character's name, the history from 10, 20,000 years back. You know, like this is, this is the, this is like the incentive, the, the, the natural inclination that we have as uh, role-playing gamers and stuff like that. We want to just straight up create an entire world that's as nuanced as the real world but he says like this is fine if you want to just do it for fun but if you're designing a setting that is intended to be used as a setting for role-playing games especially if you're going to publish the setting or um you know you're you're creating it specifically to play a game that like your characters aren't going to see this whole crazy big world you've built then you might want to focus on the elements of history and lore that directly influence the plot and the things around the characters. All right, so it kind of kind of example he gives. Let me see if he writes that out. Oh, and actually, this is a really good point. He says, if everything is design, uh, is every if everything is defined somewhere, the DM has no latitude to invent his own material. So if you are saying like, there's a castle of the Dark Lord. And uh, upon this hill, uh, and it only appears at midnight on the full moon. All right, that's cool. Now the DM's like, all right, I got a castle, full moon, midnight, evil lord. You might want to give a little more description, like, okay, he's a warlock who this, or you don't even have to actually. You could stop there. But if you get too detailed, like, cup appears in the full moon, and this is what the layout of castle, and this is this and that, and he has a friend named this guy, and sometimes he goes over here, and this blah 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 then the DM has to just memorize all that information and then regurgitate it to the players. And I kind of think it takes away from the GM or the adventure, the AM, the adventure master, as I'm calling them in World of Chibu, it takes away from the AM's, um, the AM's ability to just be creative and have fun and do the things that adventure masters, game masters, dungeon masters like to do, which is to create worlds and come up with cool characters and enemies of their own or tweak ones that are there and make them do things they want them to do. You know, so um, so I think if you just say like, okay, the, the thing appears at midnight and there's an evil warlord who wants to take over this town, that's enough for the, the GM to be like, all right, I'm gonna make my evil warlord. You give him a name if you want. You give him, you know, uh, I'm gonna make him do this and I'm gonna make him wear that, and he's gonna have a uh, a dire bear as his as his animal companion, his friend, and he's going to. Um, you know, have a, a small army of uh, drow elves that follow him because he made a deal with them. And, you know, like, just, you can do whatever you want. It's fun. You can use the enemies and the, and, the, and the lore and stuff that you want, and you can plop it into your world even. You don't even have to use it in that world. So I think that's, that's like, a good, a, good, a good point to consider. Like, let's, let's make this fun for the dungeon master, and let's make it fun for the players. Um, so what makes good instigation? So the next section is about conflict and instigation, all right? Um, he says, all sources of human conflict, love, war, revolution, murder, betrayal, greed, theft, oppression, religion, national pride, um, slavery, and raw lustful power. <laughs> they are all hardy stuff. They, they, these are hardly the stuff of real life amusement, he says. Quite the contrary, but for fictional entertainment, they are the tools of your toolbox as you consider the main characters and societies. Peaceful hobbity shires are exactly the sort of places you want to live as cheerful, peaceful, kindly neighbors. But your first instinct as a game designer should be to convince the players that it's a fine place worth saving just before the orcs invade and burn it down. So I like this idea of manipulating your characters or your players' emotions, set them up so like they feel good about something and then threaten that thing so that they actually want to stop the threat, you know, instead of just saying like, you're in this town and it gets attacked and uh, you want to save it, right? I mean, why wouldn't you want to save this town? It's a town. You got to save towns. You don't just let towns get attacked. That's, what do we mean? That's, that's, that's adventuring, that's D&D &D 101, you know? So, but instead you can say like, welcome to the town of 
of, of cake candy, the sweetest town on earth. And oh, you guys, uh, why don't you go, uh, the, the friendly candy shop what beckons you over. And he says, here, try some free samples. And you guys eat it and oh, it, it heals you five HP and it's gonna give you a plus two to your uh, charisma modifier. Um, for the rest of the day. What isn't that great? Oh, what a lovely town. Hey, why don't you go over to the weaponsmith? Oh, he's gonna enchant your weapon? Uh, that's great. He's got all these enchantments, but before he can enchant your weapon, what was that? Holy smokes! It's a, it's a monitor! Ah, kill it! Kill it! <laughs> and then they're gonna be like, you know what? I don't need this. It's not cold. <laughs> um, uh, he's gonna, it's gonna, and the, the, the characters are gonna be like, oh, I wanna buy more candy and I wanna uh, enchant my weapons, but I didn't get a chance to, and if this town gets destroyed, I'm not gonna get any of that cool stuff. So let me go ahead and save this town real quick, and I'll come back and, and do these things. Or maybe they'll be evil and be like, all right, let's let the town just get, get messed up a little, and then we'll loot the, loot the you know, loot the candy store and loot the, uh, the enchanter's place. Well, enchanter, I don't know if you can, I guess you could try to force him to enchant something for you. It's not very nice, you guys. It's not very nice. So you see what I mean? Like if you establish the the thing that you want them to protect or maybe it's like a person and they're like really nice or something, let them spend a little time with that person I think is a good idea, a little time in that town. Make it something they like, make it something that they want to defend. And then give them something to defend it from. So I think we're getting close to, uh, close to getting to what I wanted to say. Oh no, there's a lot more interesting stuff here. See, look at all this stuff I'm learning. So thinking about the history, why write a history, okay? You're gonna focus on the now. On, wait, focus on the now on conflict. I'm gonna skip ahead a little here. Make sure that for each reference to ages long past, there's some element of that history that is real and present, that is a real and present danger or conflict, okay? So if you're gonna have history, if you're gonna have lore, make sure it's relevant. I think that's pretty much what he's saying here. Like, you don't need to know about something that happened a thousand years ago unless that guy who died a thousand years ago was coming back as a lich today because then you might want to know like what his mo was back then so you can kind of have a better idea on how to take him down or what his motivation is you know what i'm saying if he died because he was betrayed by his lover and now his lover has like a big statue in town square or something then maybe he wants to destroy that statue to get vengeance or something, you know? So then, okay, now the lore and the history has some uh, pertinence to the current current events. So I think that's pretty simple. Like, when you come up with history and lore, if you're designing a setting, don't, don't like, bring up all the history and lore that has nothing to do with what's going on in the setting at this time. And I think for me, for a world of Chibu, I'm considering of creating, because uh, I have to do a separate campaign setting book. I'm almost done with the rule book. But, um, and if you guys want to check it out and get in on the playtesting and stuff, come join me over on Discord and you can check out the Google Doc that has all the rules and stuff and make your own characters. If three people have already made characters, um, maybe even four now. So, so yeah, so, um, what was I saying? That, oh yeah, for, I'm thinking of maybe creating the campaign, ha uh, the, the campaign setting will actually take place in three different ages. So that if you want to play in the cataclysmic age, not 10,000 years ago, I'm probably gonna make them separate out by a couple hundred years. Um, so it's still kind of like what happened in the first age is still pretty relevant to people who are living in the second age and maybe even in the third age. But the first age is this big cataclysm, so it's gonna be more like survivalist. Oh no, actually the first age is the cataclysm, but there's large population, so it's gonna be all out war between large populations of peoples. Um, fighting over a small amount of land and they end up killing each other. The second age is basically like survivalist where there's small tribes everywhere just trying to, to get by after everyone's been killed and stuff and all these elementals are wreaking havoc on the world. Um, then they're just like kind of like small groups of scattered peoples. And the third age would kind of be more what you expect with medieval fantasy settings where there are established kingdoms but there's a good amount of wilderness. It's not overpopulated, it's not underpopulated. And that's probably your go-to setting. But I like the other two because the first one is just all-out war. If you want to play a war-based campaign with lots of large-scale battles and armies and stuff like that and just constant warfare everywhere you go. And then the second one is more like survivalist, like slow going. You're gonna have encounters, you're gonna like 
you know there's a lot of room for like if you want to build your own city you could do that and then maybe that would your GM could carry that into the third age and it could be an established uh, location so that's kind of one way I'm tackling this and uh, one of the reasons why I'm reading this book and making these videos is to start stimulating ideas like that and trying to create the best world I possibly can so let's see what else we got in here so you're saying that's why why when you write a history you're gonna think about the the practical implications of that history on your characters today so I have this outline let's see what this says um, I see that there's a minimum amount of history required for a setting to make sense some short overview of how and why empires fell the God shaped the world okay yeah I kind of remember what this is saying second category historical backdrops um, helps the world builder write adventures and stories because they have a better understanding where a secret society came from or why two races are uh, still fighting. The origins of conflict are usually fairly straightforward to explain and very few require full-blown uh, in-character fiction diagrams of relevant battles. Okay, so basically he's saying like to know to know the story, the story that you need to know, you don't need like really in-depth details, you just need the gist of things. So. A ruler gets betrayed by his counselor, murdered, and the counselor is now the um, the the king. And maybe you want to add like a little bit more, like the counselor is actually working for an evil lich, and um, that's it. That's all you need. And give him maybe give him some names if you want. But like you don't need to know that the king's daughter had a crush on the counselor. I mean maybe that's kind of cool, but a crush on counselor. But then she was sad that he was betrayed by the by she betrayed her father so she left the kingdom fearing for her own life and then he did this and then that did that blah 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 i mean like if it's relevant to the story because they're going to meet the princess and then come and that's how they're going to get their quest hook definitely include that but if the princess had an ex-boyfriend five years ago who broke up with her because she was obsessed with this counselor and he's not going to be in the story like it's kind of interesting but i mean you could just leave it out I, that's i think what they're saying and um, I don't know if you guys agree or disagree about like the nuanced details like how much that adds or subtracts from the storytelling and gaming experience. Let me know in the comments. But I think the, I, I kind of agree that like extraneous details are that just that extraneous. If the detail is important enough to add intrigue, I mean, you can just give it in a sentence. Like I said, like, um, yeah, she, uh, this, this princess had a boyfriend from five years ago who broke up with her and disappeared because she was obsessed with this councilman. And then they repair your, your her party's like, she says that to the party or something. They're like, okay, whatever. And then you go on and then maybe that guy shows up at some point. And you're like, but that's all you needed to say. Just like a little sentence, a little something. You don't need to give him a, a details and names and his own history and his own family and blah, blah, blah. And where, what, where he's been the last five years. Like, who cares where he's been the last five years? Maybe if you want to, if you're... You have something in your mind if the characters ask, but it doesn't have to be more detailed than I've been roaming the lands, uh, looking, gaining power so that I may get my revenge. Okay, cool. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you now, so your backstory is kind of moot. <laughs> characters that are about to die don't, never mind, <laughs> don't need a strong backstory. Um, so, okay, is we're getting close to the end we're getting close to the summary right here but he's saying right here you're gonna find I like this a lot you want to have in your world places worth exploring societies worth visiting and villains who are both easy to understand and satisfying to defeat I want to talk about each of those things just a tiny bit places worth exploring make them look cool man this is why I like map drawing because I feel like if you draw a cool little feature on a map like a strange thing or it's town or whatever and you can say, oh, that looks interesting. I want to explore that. It gives you just enough information I want to explore. I think you can also uh, achieve this narratively. Tell a person, like, just over the hills, there's uh, just over, just across those mountains, there's a town that is known for creating the finest, uh, the finest uh, ranged weaponry. And uh, it's inhabited by both elves and dwarves that have come to live in peace and find a uh, common ground in their love for great craftsmanship all right that's i think that's a place worth exploring you're gonna meet some elves you're gonna meet some dwarves you're gonna have some good shopping experiences and then i put a mountain range in between where you are and they are so that i can add some uh, little you know little venture on the way there so um society's worth visiting again i think that's a society worth visiting the elves and dwarves getting along maybe society's worth visiting because it's actually kind of messed up and you want to you want to help fix it you know what if uh, 
what if the tieflings are oppressing the humans, you know, and they're just kind of all the humans are slaves in this city of, to a small group of powerful tieflings. Well, it might take a small party of uh, four level 15 adventurers to take out the, the level 10 to 12 tiefling, you know, elite group that have been oppressing the humans in this city for so many years, you know, and that's a society worth exploring, I think, or worth visiting because you're going to want to help them out and then you might be the new leader of the city. That's kind of cool. And then villains who are both easy to understand and satisfying to defeat. That feels so good to me. I love that sentence right there. It's just easy to understand and satisfying to defeat. That feels good. All right, I want to know what this villain's all about. I want to know why he wants to kill people. I want to know why he wants to destroy the world. Maybe I agree with him. Or maybe he's just, uh, maybe like, again, it's for love. And you're like, well, you are really evil, but you are doing it for love or whatever, you know? And then satisfying to defeat. If he dies, what's gonna happen aside from he died? Well, okay, you're gonna save someone. That should be maybe, or maybe you're gonna um, change the political dynamic of a kingdom. That's pretty satisfying. Or maybe he's just going to explode into like all these sparkles and stuff and drop his magic weapons. And you're going to get all these magic weapons. Ooh, that's pretty satisfying. <laughs> so yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a couple examples. But I would actually really love to hear your guys' ideas on what would make a villain really satisfying to defeat. What's the most satisfying thing that could happen after you defeat a villain as far as you think, as, as far as you feel like on, as a player, what would be the most satisfying thing? Um, so that's pretty much it. And all of this is in order to design a professional game setting. I don't know if you can see that, but I like that. We're designing a professional game setting, you know? And even if you're doing it for fun, when you do something for fun, but try to do it at a professional level, I mean, you can just, you don't have to, but it can be even more fun. And then also the finished products is awesome. So I think that's pretty cool. Stay tuned for the next uh, Kobold's world building. Let's see, what's the next one on here? We got, the next chapter is going to be different kinds of world building. Oh, and we're going to be talking about world building for novelists, for games, uh, and stuff like that. Great. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope I'll see you guys in the next video. Till then, peace, God bless, and stay fantastic, everyone.